Gibraltar was taken from Spain in August 1704 by an Anglo-Dutch force during the War of the Spanish Succession in the name of the Archduke Charles of Austria, pretender to the Spanish throne. The years that followed, the history of Gibraltar was written mainly by military men. So, of course, military exploits loom large. It is what mattered to them. The ordinary people in Gibraltar at the time and in the years that followed were of little importance to them. So it is hardly surprising that the stories of the lives of these ordinary people remained untold. It's important to recover their voices and to understand what their lives were like what the lives of ordinary people were like. Let us start in August 1704. Why do the names of Gertrudis, Maria, Rosa, Antonia and Maria Teresa not figure among the list of Spaniards who stayed behind in Gibraltar in August 1704. Why are these names not familiar to us today? They ought to be because they stayed behind in Gibraltar in August 1704. Maybe it's because they were black slaves. Yes, there were black slaves in Gibraltar, both before and after August 1704. We need to set slavery at the time in context. We all know about Article 10 of the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713 between Britain and Spain, under which Gibraltar was given to Britain in perpetuity by Spain. But less well known is Article 12 here. And under this article, Spain granted Britain what was called El Pacto del Asiento de los Negros. Now, essentially, this was an agreement under which Britain got a monopoly for the supply of black slaves to the American possessions and to the Caribbean. So this was something which was of huge commercial importance to Britain. And prior to Britain obtaining El Asiento, which it obtained from the 1st of May 1713 for a period of 30 years, it was France that had enjoyed this monopoly. So Britain was involved in the slave trade in a very significant way. It is no surprise, therefore, that there were black slaves in Gibraltar at the time. 
slavery, in any case, was something with which Gibraltar was familiar, both in Spanish times and after the British arrived in 1704. This building is part of what was once the convent of La Merced, the Whitefriars Convent. The role of the friars was to ransom Christians, white men, the sailors and the passengers on ships who had been captured by the Barbary Corsairs, the Barbary pirates, and made slaves. And these Corsairs used to operate along the Atlantic coast of Morocco. After the Mercedarian friars left, the role of ransoming white persons who had been enslaved in Morocco was taken over by the British government. And they sent the governor of Gibraltar money, ransom money, for this purpose on a number of occasions. So there's a history at this time, not only of black persons being enslaved, but also white persons. The house that stood here on this site, which was totally destroyed during the Great Siege because of the intensity of the bombardment, would have been known to a slave, Josefa, and a few years later to another slave, Leonor Maria. This was the house of Giovanni Battista Sturla. He was appointed Genoese consul, and a few years later, also French consul. His mother-in-law also had a slave. On one occasion, in 1719, two Turkish slaves married each other here in this church. Pedro Joseph, the slave of Don Mateo de la Mesa, married Maria Josefa de Jesus. And Pedro had another distinction, because he's the only male slave whose name has survived to this date. All the other slaves of this period, whose names we know, were women. There were also freed slaves, slaves who had been made free by their owners. And they included Maria Manuela de la Cruz. And we can see here from the register that she was the freed slave of El Conde de la Rosa from Barcelona. And she married a Genoese man. Here is the record. He was Lázaro Torres. And their marriage was in April 1705. It was the first wedding after the siege of 1704 going into 1705 when the troops that were loyal to the Bourbon pretender to the Spanish throne tried to retake Gibraltar after it had been captured. Of course, they were unsuccessful. And one might think that marrying a slave, even a freed slave, was not a particularly good choice. But given the lack of eligible marriage partners in Gibraltar in 1704 and 1705, anybody who was free to marry was an eligible partner. And it wasn't the only marriage of a freed slave at the time. Josefa Maria Francisca married Josefaina of the Austrian Empire in 1714. Other freed slaves were Maria and Francisco, who were both 66 years old when they married here in August 1704, and Diego el Turco. The attitude to slaves in the early days of British Gibraltar was ambiguous. On the one hand, they were being denied their freedom. They were the property of their owners. On the other hand, they were baptized as Catholics and given Christian names. And this was to ensure that in the afterlife, their souls would be saved. 
So their bodies in the present life mattered less to their owners than the souls in the future life. And there's something else, and that is that by renaming slaves, they were being denied a part of their cultural heritage. Slaves were sometimes used by their owners for their personal gratification. They were liable to abuse. Antonia, the black slave of Dr. Trujillo, the physician, was pregnant when Gibraltar was taken in August 1704. She bore a child, a boy, on the 18th of December 1704. This is the font where the boy was christened and named Juan de la O. But in 1704, the baptismal font was not situated here. It was located at the bottom of the church in the southwest corner. And at the christening, the owner of the slave declared that the boy was to be free from birth. And this was important because a child of a slave was also automatically a slave unless freed by the owner. And the reason why I think that Dr. Trujillo freed the boy is that he was the father and he did not want his son to be a slave. And in fact, I suspect that the reason why Dr. Trujillo remained in Gibraltar in 1704 when most of the Spaniards left is that he was indeed the father of the child and he got Antonia pregnant. Three of the slaves that we know of died in the early years of British Gibraltar. Maria, the slave of Captain Pedro Machado, died in July 1715. She was only 25. The following month, Josefa, the slave of Beatriz de Herrera, died. She was 50. The slave of Pedro de Salas, died in March 1717. She was 40 years old and her death was tragic. She drowned. Two years after the death of her slave Josefa, Doña Beatriz de Herrera acquired a new slave, Leonor Maria, in 1717. This was after the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713, under which Gibraltar became British. And it shows that even after Utrecht, it was still possible to obtain slaves in Gibraltar. So where did most of the slaves in Gibraltar come from? The answer lies on the other side of the strait. Ceuta, the Spanish enclave in Morocco, is where a slave market was situated. Slaves were bought and sold by the principal merchants and even by clergymen. And we know that from records at the time that many of the slaves were tattooed by their owners so that they could be readily identified. And it is from there, from Ceuta, that most of the slaves in Gibraltar would have been brought here. Owning a slave was a status symbol in early 18th century Gibraltar. Only the powerful and the wealthy could afford to do so. The owner of another slave, Teresa Juana de Palma, was Francisco Estan. He is referred to in the records of the time as Don Francisco which shows that he was a person of rank. So 
how do we know about these slaves? Well, their names were recorded in these registers. Whenever they baptized a child, whenever they were married, or whenever they died. And this tells us, of course, that if anyone who was a slave at the time did not marry, did not baptize a child, or did not die, then the names were not recorded here. So it means there probably were more slaves than those whose names have come down to us over the years through these registers. At the time of the siege of 1727, many of the Spaniards who had stayed in Gibraltar in August 1704 and who were still living here decided at that point to leave because they were not prepared to endure another siege. They had come this way. They had come out of Landport Gate and along the causeway to Spain. Those who had slaves would have taken them with them. And after the siege of 1727, the number of references to slaves in Gibraltar is much fewer. One case from 1766 stands out. A slave ran away from his master in Gibraltar and escaped to Spain. He was a slave boy. And the owner of the slave asked the governor of Gibraltar to request the commandant at San Roque to arrange for the return of the boy, because there were arrangements at the time between the two generals for the return of fugitives. The answer that came back was that it was not possible to return the boy because he had converted to Catholicism and he was now under the protection of the Bishop of Malaga. This tells us that by 1766, the time for owning slaves in Gibraltar had passed. The story had an unusual ending. When word of what had happened spread in Gibraltar, two soldiers who wanted to run away to Spain and did not want to be returned as fugitives and severely punished, escaped across the border and said that they also want to convert to Catholicism. Returning to the story of the black slave boy, the owner of the slave did not end up out of pocket. The story came to the ears of the Spanish king and he paid the owner the 31 pounds that he had paid to buy the slave in the first place. The king then gave the boy his freedom. So the story ended up very well for the boy. The owner of the slave had to go over to Algeciras to collect his money and to sign a document agreeing that the slave had been freed. And this case is the only occasion when we hear of what it cost to buy a slave. 31 pounds and 31 pounds in 1766 was the equivalent today of about 5,500 pounds. By the time of the Great Siege in 1779, there were only three black persons in Gibraltar that we're aware of. They would have known this building here behind me. Their names figure in the census of 1777. They were Jane, aged 30, Nancy, aged 9, and Betty, aged 4. So Nancy and Betty were clearly Jane's daughters. And the most important thing is that they were listed in the census not as slaves, but as servants. A servant is a person who is in paid employment, but more important of all, it's a person who is free. The census of 1777 was divided into three sections. The first listed the Protestant inhabitants, the second the Catholics, and the third the Jewish inhabitants. Jane, Nancy and Betty, all three, were listed in the third section of the census which recorded the names of the Jewish inhabitants of Gibraltar.
the population of Gibraltar then dropped to about 500 or 600 people. It grew again after the siege, but by then the period for owning slaves in Gibraltar had gone for good. Coming back to Jane, Betty and Nancy, what is shocking is that girls aged a mere nine years and a tiny four-year-old were already servants. Life was hard for a lot of people at this time. And in this particular case, we've got a woman like Jane with two young children and no husband that we know of to look after the family. It must have been particularly tough. It is easy to be judgmental of what went on in Gibraltar in August 1704 and in the early years of British Gibraltar. From our perspective today, slavery is totally unacceptable. But at the time, it was something that just happened. No one thought to question whether it was ethical or proper to deprive a person of his or her liberty and oblige them to work for no pay. Some slaves had good masters and mistresses who looked after them. Others were freed and they went on to enjoy their lives. Unfortunately, others would have been the object of abuse and gratification of their masters and they would have had a hard time. One wonders whether the death by drowning of a slave, Maria Teresa, in 1717, when she was 40 years old, was an accident or whether the woman was so desperate that she took her own life. We shall never know. Again, we do not know what sort of suffering the slaves in Gibraltar suffered. What we do know is that there were a number of black slaves in Gibraltar in the early days of British Gibraltar, that the number of slaves had decreased very sharply by the end of the siege of 1727, and that by the 1770s, there were no slaves that we know of in Gibraltar. This dark chapter in the history of Gibraltar had finally been closed. we will be looking at the convent, the residence of His Excellency the Governor, and how it was acquired by the military authorities.